Yes, thank you, Lord, for this evening and this time. Thank you that we can live in this time and be part of the kingdom and we can preach the gospel and we can tell others about, about Jesus. And mm. we thank you, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Mm. Yep. Great is the mystery of godliness, and great is the mystery of godliness. Okay. For God oh. to become flesh, for God to be justified in the spirit, for God oh. to be seen of the angels, for God oh. to be praised to the Gentiles, for God oh. to be believed on in the world, for God to be received into glory, and great is the mystery of of godliness great is the mystery of godliness and great is the mystery of godliness for god to become flesh for god to be justified in the spirit for god to be seen of the angels for God to be praised to the Gentiles, for God to be believed on in the world, for God to be received into glory, and great is the mystery. Of godliness for the last time. Great is the mystery of godliness, and great is the mystery of godliness for God to become flesh, oh, for God to be justified in the spirit, for God to be seen of the angels for God to be preached to the Gentiles for God to be believed on in the world for God to be received into glory and great is the mystery of God to receive the Holy Spirit he inspired so many of us to make some very wonderful contribution, contribution towards the earnestness of the matter that concerns the great salvation, the common salvation. The Lord has been speaking to us about this important scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And the Holy Spirit had made us realize that the mystery of godliness is a package that is resting upon six pillars and the spirit of the living God had taught us few things about the first three pillars and then now he's trying to establish the fourth pillar which is preaching unto the Gentiles and as we have said previously if we didn't have any understanding of the first three pillars there is no story to tell the Gentiles the Gentiles need to hear something something that carries life not the letter, but something that has the presence of the Spirit, the justifier, the Holy Ghost himself, the writer of scriptures. He is the one that keeps the scripture alive. He is the one that keeps the scripture performing. Because the Bible says, Blessed is she that believe, for there shall be a performance of the things that were told her by the Lord. The Holy Ghost is the performer, is the doer, is the one that creates this mystery of godliness in the heart of everyone who encounters the same controversy. He was the one that raised Jesus Christ from the dead by the spirit of holiness, Romans chapter 1. 
It was through him that Jesus offered himself unto God without sin, by the same spirit. It was by the same spirit he was conceived in the womb of a woman. He said, the Holy Ghost will overshadow you. And the power of the highest will come upon you. It was by the same spirit. And it is by the same spirit that the apostles received the revelation that they have been transferred down to us, that have been delivered to us. By the same spirit, the Bible says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That no part of the prophecies of any private interpretation. And so it is by the same spirit, this scripture has been kept alive for thousands of years. And it is by the same spirit it has been delivered unto us. And if it gets to us, we can remove the spirit and then pass that letter. No, we must continue to ensure that the Holy Ghost remains within the content of this word of God. That's what keeps it alive. And whosoever receives both the spirit and the word, they receive life. And Jesus said, the word I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That means in the content of what he was saying, life is there, but the productivity of life is an indication that the Holy Ghost is present therein. Because wherever the Holy Ghost is, there is life. He is the spirit of life. So when Jesus said, the word I speak to you are spirit and life, is an indication that the content of what he was saying was not what the Pharisee was saying. The Pharisees had words, but there was no life in it because there was no spirit. Great is the mystery of godliness. For us to be able to preach to the Gentiles, life must be in what we are saying. Not life that we have to put in ourselves as a matter of force or manual calibration. No, it is life that comes out of our being, out of our belly shall flow out rivers of living water. Because the preacher's mouth and the preacher's heart connect to that life-giving source that is translated into the heart of the sinner to reproduce the same effect. Because the Holy Ghost does not have a twin, the same spirit. Hence, the scripture says we are baptized into one spirit. We have one Lord, one baptism. And so our salvation should not be different from somebody else's if truly we are baptized into the same spirit. And so preaching the gospel to the Gentiles is a pillar in the mystery of godliness. But there are so many things about it. And two weeks then ago, the Holy Spirit opened the chapter to us about a battlefield, about a race we've got to negotiate for as it pertains to this matter of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. But we have to recap a few things. Let's see. Sako, will you help us start? Yes, thank you. Yes, we talk about last time about we had this metaphor uh, that there is this kind of uh, running race on the track when when there is this baton and teams and they pass the baton and each one keeps running running uh, towards the finish line and then they pass the baton to the next person and that is very good uh, example of our faith and this race we are running that we run with the baton and we didn't invite the baton but the baton was invited when Jesus died in the cross and uh, saved all every person who believes on him and that baton has been uh, established since then and uh, it has been passed on from generation to the next generation and we are in this run now and uh, we have this short time in this earth running with the race and that really has an effect of what we do with the button we just cannot uh, hold the button and stand stand but we must run with it and pass it to the next version that is important we have the uh, we keep going and also we talk about that if we see a person next to us who is also running the race with baton and that baton has something different that uh, true baton that is true gospel for example if there is a church that has many members and nice lighting system and nice singing and dancing and smoke machine and all kind of things but if they don't go out and preach the gospel uh, then the people of God is perishing and we, we have the responsibility to tell them that uh, you don't have the baton and you must take the button, which is true, but um, I think that is what uh, I remember from last time. Thank you very much. As Sako was speaking, a scripture came to my mind. Johanny Ebos read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The transfer of the button from one generation to another, from one people to another, from one tribe to another, from one ethnic group to another. The transfer. Paul the apostle took a button and he invaded Ephesus and left something there. He 
invaded Philippa, he left something there. He invaded Thessalonica, he left something there. He invaded Colossae, he left something there. What does he call that? Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which swelled first in thy grandmother Louis and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Do we see what Paul was talking about? He was talking about three generations. The grandmother had something. She had it first. The grandmother received the baton first. And the grandmother was able to transfer not just the wood, but the spirit that keeps the race alive transferred it to the mother and then the mother was able to transfer the content of the spirit of the baton, the race, the unfeigned faith, that is what it is endlessly contained for the faith the unfeigned faith another word we can use there is the unpretended faith a faith that does not have any shadow of turning, not a smoke screen kind of faith as Sako has said, not a dancing artistic kind of faith not a cake and coffee faith, that is not transferable. That's a rotting battle. Not ability to play saxophone, ability to blow trumpet, ability to play, play the keyboard or piano. That is not unfeigned faith. The faith we are talking about is what is fabricated in the heart of a man as a texture that is palpable, can be touched and experienced. It, it doesn't come to renovate our sinful life. No. The unfeigned faith superimposed upon the blind of dead works, a new life that is devoid of the corrupted nature. And we have the power to contend with the flesh and to win the battle. Why? Because the spirit man is no longer a product of the fallen nature. It was a superimposition by the second Adam that is not earthly but heavenly. And so we have a law in our mind that begins to war against the flesh. Why? Because God comes and paralyzes the equation between the spirit and the flesh as a result of an introduction of something powerful, the life-giving word but in uh, uh, intertwined by the in, by the spirit intertwined with the holy spirit and produces a new man a new man a new man and it is that new man that has the texture the originality of this unfeigned faith and can present it to somebody else so an unregenerated life, an unregenerated preacher, a preacher who is still corrupted in the inner man, but he has a degree of theology, master's degree, and so he's on the pulpit preaching to people. Such a man cannot transfer life. So we don't expect to hear a story like this. When I call to remembrance of the unfeigned faith which is in you. So Paul was talking about Timothy, that is the third generation. And Paul said, it didn't actually begin with you. This thing I heard that is in you, that is so powerful, that has made you, qualified you to be an apostle or a bishop. Now you are my beloved son in verse 2. You have received the grace. It is an introduction to something that I also carry, but he didn't dwell in you first. He dwelt in your grandmother first. And this thing is so powerful that it can be preserved from one generation to another, and the content can be passed down from the grandmother to the child, and then to the child's child, and also to do so afar off, even as many as the Lord shall call the originality of this faith. This is what we should contend for. Not what people are trying to pass down to us today. People are trying to force feed us today with a faith that is feigned, pretentious, not original, devoid of the power of the scriptures, so devoid of the spirit of life. A faith whereby people romance darkness, romance oppression, romance spiritual affliction, romance addiction, romance impurity, romance inconsistency, romance prayerlessness what kind of faith is that what the apostle calls this faith unpretended unfeigned without any shadow of tone you don't come in the day and it looks like red and then in the evening it turns to orange and tomorrow morning it is yellow and next tomorrow is blue and you wonder how did what was the color when we began that kind of faith that is giving to circumstantial change this is a faith that causes men to be cast into fire and refuse and they refuse to deny 
knowledge. This is a faith that people decide to think in their mind that this one is more precious than having one more apartment, one more prosperity, one more promotion, one more. This, have, this is a faith that causes men to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. It is called unfeigned faith. That is what was delivered to the saints. And here we see three saints have been mentioned. Three saints have been mentioned in according to their generation. And you see, when the faith came into the heart of the grandmother, she never knew that that faith was capable to transfer to the third generation. Not only that, the faith that entered into Timothy made Timothy somewhat greater than even the grandmother. That is the capabilities in this faith. So it is possible that a child will be greater than his parent when a child negotiates with this faith because it is unfeigned. It is original. It can produce anything. It can produce creativity. It can produce resurrection. It doesn't matter the battles we fought many years ago. It doesn't matter the battles our parents had fought. It doesn't matter their confusion. It doesn't matter the confusion of the third generations away. It doesn't matter the idol worship and the idolatry of a system of a country. When someone is introduced to the unfeigned faith, he has the capability to create a new ancestral dimension, a new genealogy, a genealogy of power, a genealogy of spirit, a genealogy of life. Paul said, I call to remembrance. Who is going to forget such a thing? And so today, what do we see? When the first generation lacks on faint faith, woe betide the next generation because there is nothing to pass down. When the next generation has mutilated faith, inconsistent faith, they are not strong enough to fight sin. But the apostle said, resisting unto blood, fighting against sin. Why? Those people were not doing it with their physical hands. There was a law in their mind. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It is resident in their spirit. They had the capability to throw the battle line to the enemy's camp and say here too far and no further. They resisted against sin. Why? Something was to be charging them from within. The unfeigned faith. I remember Yohani or somebody was telling Yohani will say, oh be careful, slow down so that you don't get burnt out. Hmm. The faith did not burn out in the grammar mother Lois. The faith did not burn out in Eunice, the mother. The faith did not burn out in Timothy. If we are to look at it like that, we expect that the fire would have gone down by the time he gets to Timothy. And Timothy will just be the spiritual cripple, a spiritual epileptic guy, just walking with one limb, you know, and just hoping and looking for spiritual crutch to rest upon after two minutes. But after three generations, it looks as if Phil, Timothy was the first to receive the faith. The fire that was in the heart of Timothy gave us at least nine chapters in the Bible, if not ten. Timothy had a faith that was so powerful that God had to create a scripture for him. This faith does not burn out. And this is an encouragement to us that this thing that the Holy Ghost is fabricating within us, it is transferable to the next generation. This thing that the Holy Ghost is configuring within our system can last the, the test of time. It doesn't matter what civilization changes. It doesn't matter economic meltdown and recession. It doesn't matter what the world is crying about, wars and rumors of war. There is something that cannot erode the power and the potency of this unfeigned faith. Is the fact that it carries the life of the Holy Ghost itself. And the Holy Ghost is not given to weather conditions. Or do global warming also affect him? Do climate change also affect him? Do, do ozone depletion also affect him? The Holy Ghost, even when the world was without form and void, he was on the surface of the deep and brooding there, unchanged. The capability was there, only waiting for the word of the Lord. That is what forms the nidos, the basis, the fulcrum, the pivot of our faith on faint faith. This is what we contend for. Why should we contend for it? As Sakura said before we make our comments. We contend for it because when we lose this faith, we have lost a generation. Come to think of it. If something happened between the grandmother and the, and, and the mother of Timothy, something might have happened to Timothy. It is possible that Timothy will never be remembered. Do you remember Timothy's classmate? No. Do we remember his neighbor? No. 
it looks as if only Timothy was alive in his own time. The unfeigned faith keeps us alive. Anyone who touches the unfeigned faith will remain alive forever. Why? The Bible says in 1 John, those that do the will of God shall abide forever. Why? The unfeigned faith does not die. It has the capacity of spiritual life. And that is what we preach. That's why Paul the Apostle said, if an angel come from heaven and preach another gospel, let him be accursed. You know why? Because Paul was looking at the problem and the calamity of a generation that lacked an unfeigned faith, an unpretended faith. Perhaps, I'm sensing, you are near post the amplified version of that chapter. Let's see if it's able to, if it's used other, other terminologies that we can, we can glean from. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. Yes, Second Timothy 1 and 5 from Amplified Classic goes like, I am calling up memoirs of your sincere and unqualified faith, the leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ in absolute trust and confident in his power, wisdom and goodness. A faith that first lived permanently in the heart of your grandmother Louis and your mother Eunice and now I am fully persuaded dwells in you also. This is very serious. Look at the terminologies here. The first thing he mentioned talks about the characteristics of this faith. It talks about the faith that is sincere, unqualified. Why is it unqualified? Because we don't need to add anything to it. Neither does the faith look for rich people to go into. The faith is not only for those who have positions in the palaces or in the places of authority. No, it is a faith that is given to every man. You don't need a credential for it. You receive it from heaven free of charge. Freely, he gave it to us. If he can give us his own son, will he not give us all things? The faith does not require you to have an educational status or a social economic status to receive this uncorruptible seed. The ignorant can have it. The unlearned can have it. The military officers can have it. The civilians can have it. The poor can have it. The rich can have it. If the rich man was begging in, in, in hellfire to receive a dose of this, of this faith, that means he was qualified. He only chose to ignore it, thinking it was not necessary, thinking his money was more qualified. The unfeigned faith, the sincere faith, the truthful faith. But then Paul the Apostle made us realize something. He said, when that faith comes into a man, it creates an effect. What is that effect? Leaning of your entire personality on God. In Christ, in absolute trust and confidence in his power, in his wisdom and goodness. That is the capability that the faith infuses into us. We don't know why, but we have this unshakable trust, unprecedented loyalty, commitment, confidence. We lean everything. It's like you throw everything you have into this, into this. What will I put it now? Into this gamble. That is, you have five card left, five dollar left. That is all you have in life. And somebody says, if you can play this coupon and play this with your five, you will get ten million and you say ah this is the only five and to get the 10 million it is one out of two billion people that will get it and you only have five and you say well i will try even if i know the chance is so slim then i throw everything i have into the gamble. and if it does not work so i am left with nothing but that is what it is you know the wisdom of the world will say that is foolishness you don't throw that kind of gamble because that is your last card what are you going to do if you miss it right when it comes to the unfeigned faith we throw everything into the land everything we throw everything hook lie and sinker why? Because if Jesus was able to risk, if God was able to risk Christ from the dead, there is nothing else he cannot do for us. If Jesus could not be defeated by the power of death, but he rose and said, because I live, you will live also. It means we can throw our oak lion sinker at his feet. When people make consecration to serve God, it is not a product of emotion. It is not a product of goose pimples on the skin. It is a product of the unfeigned faith. The unfeigned faith compels us because in that faith resides the capability to throw our lifeline on God. Imagine somebody sinking down the river and there is a lifeline and there is just one and there are hundreds of people in the water and everybody said, we are all adults, but there is only one baby there. Let's give the baby the lifeline. We will sort out our life. 
That is what it is. But the interesting thing is that in the ocean of life, even when there is no lifeline, God, the creator of the ocean, is around. And he can never allow the ocean to swallow up his children. And so the unfeigned faith has a characteristic to produce inside of us the ability to lay our entire personality, not half of us. So you don't have a Christian that is partitioned 20% with God and 80% with mormons, 80% with gray message, 80% with wish, wishy board. 20% with playing witchcraft. 30% with Harry Potter. You don't have Christians like that. Those people, they don't have unfeigned faith. People who are still discussing how to listen to horoscope, watch events with time, stargazing, astrologers, magicians, how to read the palms, palm reading, and they are Christians. And they partition themselves. In one, on one part of their mouth, they speak about Christ. On the other part of their mouth, they belong to a group. They belong to a group that burns candle, that worships Satan, that use the inverted group. The pentagram. They still belong. 10% of them still belong. They still watch drama where those things are adored, where those things are worshipped, where those things. That is an indication that there is no unfeigned faith in that individual because his personality is not entirely leaning on the God of power, on the God of wisdom, and on the God of truth. Which means what the unfeigned faith, unfeigned faith produce inside of us is beyond what we can control. Is beyond what we can think about. Is beyond what somebody is saying. It is a fabrication within. All we just see is the effect. We can't apologize for it. It is an unfeigned fact. We are still in the introduction. The Holy Ghost is still trying to set the passage for today. And he's telling us, this is what we fight for. The faith that helps us to put our absolute trust, our absolute confidence in the power, in the wisdom, and in the goodness of God. And it's very instructive that the faith was not visiting the mother, the grandmother of Timothy. The faith didn't come only during the winter. And then during the summer, we can't find it. The faith the, is not a is not a traveler. The faith is not a tourist. The faith does is not a faith that comes when everything is good or when everything is bad. And we God is not an emergency firefighter. The faith is not a faith that comes only when life is about ebbing out. A COVID nineteen faith. Let us pray. COVID nineteen is, is is destroying the whole world. Let's call upon God. But no, it is a faith that is there before COVID. It is a faith that. Will be there during COVID. It is a faith that will be there after COVID. The Bible says that faith entered into the grandmother and that faith decided to live there permanently. It is that kind of characterization that is transferable. If the faith we have is not permanent, it can be transferred. We don't transfer something epileptic. That means that woman so lived a life of total reliance on God, even when everything does not look likely. It was a product of what the faith that she had acquired had accomplished in her life. Absolute dependence on God. Absolute. 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 And it is a faith that stays permanently. And so when we look at our environment, we look at everything around us, we look at people. What kind of faith do they have? Is it the one that transcends? Is it the one that is permanent? Is it the faith that only comes once in a while? Is it the faith that, oh, when things are bad, I will call upon God. But when things are good, I, I just withdraw God from my equation. That faith is not permanent. That faith is not transferable. So Paul the Apostle was writing about Timothy. I am calling up memories of your sincere and unqualified faith. The leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ in absolute trust and confidence in his power, in his wisdom and his goodness. A faith that first lived permanently in the heart of your grandmother. You see, it had to tell us again where the faith usually dwells. The faith doesn't dwell in memories. The faith does not dwell as an artifact on the wall. The faith is not a cross we wear on our neck as, a, as whatever necklace. The faith is not a bangle we have on our hands. The faith is not a tattoo on our skin. Paul the Apostle said, the permanence of this faith is that its residential address is where? On our heart. Remember we heard it a few weeks ago. That the preacher's faith begins in his heart. Translates to his mouth. Expect the sinner to have 
have a mouth confession of the same faith for the sinner to receive a heart transformation of the same faith. A surgical operation that is granted to every human being as a result of introduction to the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. That's the capability. And so because this faith lived first permanently in the heart of the grandmother, Lois, it was transferred easily because it has an headquarter now. It has an embassy. An immovable place of abode. See, if we carry everywhere we are, everywhere we go, the embassy of God's righteous faith we can become God's distributor. Because why? There is a permanent abode of this faith that leans upon the authority, the wisdom, the power, and the goodness of God. We have something to distribute. We have something to pass down to the next generation. And as we have talked about it as a, as a form of a baton. And he continues. He said, this faith lived permanently in your grandmother. And then now in your mother, Eunice. And now I am fully persuaded dwells within you. Why was Paul the apostle so fully persuaded? He didn't need to interview Timothy again and again. The faith recognizes itself. If the faith that Saku has is different from the faith that Yohani has, then there's going to be a collision. There's going to be a controversy. There's not going to be a unity of faith. But if the faith is the same, all the apostle will be able to write, I am certain, without pretense, without any form of shadow of doubt, I am fully persuaded that the faith that is in Eunice, that is in Lois, is now in Timothy, you are my beloved son. Grace had worked something inside of you. And Paul could easily relate because Paul's grandfather did not have the faith. His own son did not have the faith. And now Paul the apostle, the third generation, Actually, he didn't also have the faith. What he had was the laws, the laws of the Pharisees. And he was using that to kill those that had the faith. And God entered into his lineage. Look at the brutality of his own surgical operation on the way to Damascus. He collided with something and that thing formed the texture. That thing formed a foundation in his heart. That thing was so sound that Paul the Apostle gave us practically half of the New Testament. Don't try to diminish the faith that you have in you. The capability is so massive. God does not consider our size, our stature, our skin color before the faith can have an effect. God can turn down an entire generation, an entire civilization by two short men. It is not the size of these people. It is the content within them. Why? What is the content? They rely on all the wisdom, on all the power, on all the goodness of God. As a result of that, they can tow an entire country and pull it to the foot of the cross. One man can pass through a city and empty the city into heaven, like Philip went to Samaria. There was a faith in him that had a permanent address. That man can collide with the eunuch of Ethiopia who came to Jerusalem to worship and did not receive the faith. And that man received the faith immediately just by speaking. Just by speaking. The man says, is this not water? What does in that mean to be baptized? And Jesus and Philip said, you just need to believe. He said, I believe. And they went into the river and miracle happened. That was a transfer just by the spoken word. Friends, let us look in word again and find out what is the characteristics of the faith that we have found. Is it unfeigned, unpretending, qualitative, sound? Is it the original faith that was once delivered unto the faith or to the saint? Or are we carrying about denominational creed? and doctrines of the elders? Are we carrying about righteous laws and laws of morality? Are we carrying about textures that have been delivered to us from our Sunday school teachers who read a book and decide to, from the head knowledge? Is that what forms the characteristic of our faith? If that is true, hence, yes, we cannot stand against sin because this faith is able to wrestle against iniquity. And the Bible says, seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That is a fact. So the world is going to get more terrible. The world is going to get more vicious. The world is going to get more dirty, more polluted, more ungodly, more righteous, more profane, more rebellious. But the people in the kingdom who have the faith can never be shaken. They are just established. They are just established. The faith is capable to antagonize every force that comes from the world, from the devil. The faith cannot be wrong. The faith 
cannot be agitated. The faith cannot be sent on a flight in fear. No. Why? Because this faith completely relies on the full personality of God, his goodness, his wisdom, his power, his glory. And God will never allow his glory to be tarnished by man. So if our faith is not strong enough, and in the days of adversity, our strength becomes weak, it means that our faith is, might not be original. We have to do something about it. It has to be permanent in our heart. So that means our conviction today will remain our conviction tomorrow. That means somebody says, I heard you speak three years ago. When you speak three years later, if the faith is permanent in you, you say the same thing. Then you say, oh, but you know, civilization is changing. The laws of the land are changing. Over 20 years now, we are changing our law to include and accommodate and whatever, whatever. You say, well, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Period. You are just as the Holy Ghost is. And every man that falls upon Napali, Tekalia, Durasi, Kataya, upon that faith, what happens? The person is broken to pieces. And whosoever that faith falls upon, that person is grinded to powder. It's in the Bible. It tells about the capability that resides within us. So believers, let us reconcile our present situation with the faith that we profess. If it does not have this permanence, if it does not have this utter dependence on God, if it does not have the exhibition of power and divine wisdom, then something is wrong. And the question is this. The tragedy is not only about us. The tragedy is if we fail to have the accurate and correct faith, we leave a generation into the hands of the enemy because Satan will sell something there. So the faith we have today is not a faith for us. It is a faith that is transferable. We are keeping another generation alive. If you exchange your faith with a small office, with a small job, with a small prosperity, with a small relief. If you sell your birthright, you may get away with it because God is a merciful God. But you have destroyed the capability to transfer the baton from one generation to another. And so a generation will begin where you stopped. They will begin to fight the same battle you stopped. Because there was nothing transferred to them. Let us hold fast to what we have. We have the original. Thank you, Saku, for that. Oh, Lumide, are you able to give us a few things you remember in the last meeting we had? Um, in the last Bible study, I learned that uh, the faith which uh, Brother Jude wrote about, wrote about, talks about uh, writing the uh, about the faith with the all diligence. So I learned that no part of it is unimportant. Every part of the gospel is important and every part of the faith must be communicated. So uh, we look at it in form of a baton carried by an athlete. And in that study, we were meant to know that both the carrier of the baton and the baton, it is important that both of them get to the end of the race. If the, if the person carrying the baton did not get to the end of the race, it won't be correct. At the same time, if he gets, if he finished the race without the batting, there will be, uh, then it will not be correct also. Then in that class, I also learned that uh, the faith is our heritage and is a priority. And at the same time, many people profess to carry the batting, the right batting. But we should be aware who gives us uh, the baton. And we should also be careful those we give the baton to. Because in the days of uh, Paul the Apostle, he told uh, Timothy the kind of brethren, the kind of people that can be, that the, the baton, the faith can be entrusted into uh, their hands. Then uh, apart from that, last week also, I learned that uh, as we share the gospel, sharing the gospel, which is the faith we are talking about, goes beyond mere communication. That strength and power is also communicated. And uh, it also uh, came, came up in the conversation our leader was saying a few minutes ago. So strength is also communicated uh, in place where faith is being transferred. And uh, the conversation of believer should be the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's he that was crucified, and him alone is the content of the gospel. 
So uh, the last part of what I learned last week talks about uh, the necessity of moving the gospel from generation to generation, that the gener- uh, the gospel must not end with us. It mo- we must not allow it to end, you know, to stop at our door mouth. We must make sure it is communicated from one generation to the other. And at the same time, we make sure the right one is preserved and that only the right one should be communicated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's quite extensive. So when Brother Lumide mentioned something about the baton, the scripture came to my mind. You hardly ever read. And this is quite interesting. This is quite interesting. Second Samuel 23, verse 9 and 10. It is a shadow of the substance to come. It is a story that speaks of people's experience at a particular time. For the Holy Ghost wants us to draw lessons from it. Second Samuel 23, verse 9 and 10. Verse hmm, 9. And after him was Elias at the son of Lord of the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were ga- there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword, and the Lord brought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Thank you very much. Let's give a background to this story. So the name of this warrior is Eliazar, the son of Dodo, so we will not forget. Very interesting name, Eliazar, the son of Dodo, the Hahohite. What happened? He was part of David's mighty men, and at that time, their battle was physical, and our time, our battle is spiritual. What happened at that time? is that these mighty men were contending against the Philistines. Every time the Philistine comes up and then battle is fought and they, they are defeated, they come back again. You know, it was a perpetual battle between Israelite and Philistine throughout the life of David. But for whatsoever reason, the Philistines were gathered again to battle at this time. And either there was a battle somewhere or people thought it is ta- now time to rest. It appears everybody have gone away. I will come back to this point. The Holy Ghost will take to tell us a few things because in life we will see that even people who have unfeigned faith in one way or the other they will go away from us that is when the faith we think we have will be tested if it's original. So, there was a great battle. The Philistine didn't say, well, every Israelite army are nowhere to be found. Let us postpone our battle. The enemy will never postpone their battle, even if there is nobody to fight. The enemy is always on time. The enemy has a timeline. We are the one that relax. The enemies don't. Satan do not. And the Bible tells us something here. When the Philistines were gathered to battle, so there was a troop here. There was a battalion here. Lord of soldiers with different capacity and capabilities, different strength, different artillery system, different swords, different spear, different shield, you know, as if they were coming to fight a nation. But interestingly, there was only one security officer, just one person, with a sword at the gate, probably, of the city. And there was no telephone, there was no stacom, there was no internet, there was no WhatsApp, there was no video conference call, there was no Zoom. He could not Zoom David and say, sir, we are in trouble. He was all alone. He was all alone. And he saw the enemies in their numbers. He saw the capabilities of the enemy. And this man said in his mind, I've got two options. To run and Israel is whitewashed. Or to stand and die as a valiant or as a warrior, as a martyr. Or to stand and call upon the power that is resident inside of me. And see what the power can generate. The young man of these three options took only the last one. And it is the last one we have just read about. That Paul was writing about Timothy. The unfeigned faith that lives permanently the unfeigned faith that allows us to lean our entire personality on God, on his power, on his wisdom, and on his goodness. This man called forth his unfeigned faith. That's why he could fill in the position of one of David's mighty men. He had contacted what David had. This thing is transferable. These are the men that came to David in the hole. These were the men when they came, they were in debt, they were discontented, they were discouraged. This were the men that were weary. They had nothing, but they entered into an experience with David. David's utmost 
atmosphere was an atmosphere of God. The atmosphere that tore lions and bear in the forest. The atmosphere that decapitated Goliath. These men were able to contract the same capability. And what kind of men do you think should be governizing David? Who are the people that are supposed to surround such a David? I tell you, the Holy Ghost will surround us with people that look like us for such a day of battle. Because nobody was around. They could have been facing a different war. They could have been fighting a different warfare. Nobody was around. Only one man, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Haohat. That was just a name. We don't know how tall he was, how fat or thin or slim. We don't know if we, if he, maybe he's learned or not, if he's educated. We don't know. But do you know the unfeigned faith was living permanently in his heart? Why? Because of what the next verse tells us. The young man decided not to take the easy way out. Why was he acting like that? He was acting according to the dictate of what lies within him. This is beyond human reasoning. It is a, a, According to human reasoning, he should have run away because it's a foolish human thinking to stand against an army, just one person. That is a game that is lost already. But there was something inside of him that was giving him an idea. There was something, that thing that gave David an idea that you can take up Goliath. And Saul, who was using human reasoning, said, you are a small boy. This guy has been fighting since he was a youth. How do you think? Okay, come and take all my garment. Mm. And David tried and said, this is too heavy. Please take it away. Just give him my stone. Oh, go with stone. Give me my catapult. What do you mean? This is not when Goliath saw say, Am I a dog? Hey, you think this is a dog parade? Are we shooting birds here? I mean, we are taking people's lives. And David said, My stone is sufficient because, not his, because it is not about my stone. It is about what is permanently living inside my fabric, what my life has been intertwined with. That is what informed what I say, the actions I take, how I think. The faith we have in Christ has a way to change our mindsets. People talk about impossibility for whatsoever reason. Against the tide, we talk about possibility. It is not us. It is what resides within us. This is why we must negotiate for the original. This is the man's story. Eliezer, the son of Dodo the Hawaii. The Bible says, everybody went away. Look at how verse 10 began. Second Samuel 23 verse 10. He said, he arose. See, an unfeigned faith will get us on our feet. Mark it down. An unfeigned faith is... In a believer does not allow a believer to cow to circumstance. He will rise. The Bible talks about the righteous man that falls, but he doesn't stay on the ground. He will rise again. What pulls him up? The unfeigned faith. If sometimes we say, oh, I am looking for somebody to just be here so that I can tell the person my problem. My friend, all you just need is to just go inside. Great is it that resides within you. There is a generator there. There is a dynamo there. Communicate with the Holy Ghost. And the next thing you find is that you are already rise. Rise and stand upon thy feet for I have chosen you for this purpose. <laughs> your faint faith what the apostles say when I call to remembrance you know what he called unto deep what the apostle was communicating with something within and then he was writing it down that was his personal communication Paul was talking to himself he said when I call to remembrance he was communicating with, him, with, with, with his own self my friend the faith that we have can talk to us this is a strange day so tell me a believer who is depressed I don't understand on faint faith that is depressed there is a breaking link between that faith and the message. Yes. Because this faith re relies on the absolute power, on the absolute wisdom. The faith does not mean that we will not be tempted. The faith doesn't mean that we will not be persecuted. The faith doesn't mean that we will not be tried. No. But the faith guarantees that we will not go under. We will go above. The faith guarantees. The guarantee is God himself. Johnny, you wanted to say something? Because the faith is same, the same faith that was in Jesus. It's the original faith. And let's, if you can ask him, where did Jesus waver? Was Jesus saying that maybe I can do this, maybe I cannot? Never. Because even in, at James, it said that when you pray, pray in faith, not nothing wavering. And if you are saying that maybe Jesus waved at the, wavered at the Getsemane, well, <laughs> Jesus is going against the scripture himself. No, he didn't waver. He never wavered. And this is our faith also. It is not wavering. And just like in this Eleazar, when he was facing the situation, he wasn't just came to uh, buy his own strength. He just didn't 
came to see David and just go outside and where are the Philistines I will go on there because he was he has came to David why because he had heard what David has done before and then when the situation and when he had spent time and time with David it wasn't just he heard a story if he just heard stories from David after that so David was uh, would have been saying I was so strong I let me tell the story of Goliath for the 654 times and let's just spend the time relaxing and just uh, drinking coca-cola and spending time here and uh, the be- people are just lazy and get gathering weight and then the Philistines and come and all the <laughs> Israel really would run away because they would love them coca-cola more and not be able to fade and that is not the situation but when the man came to David his life pattern started, started to change to the life pattern of faith because David didn't live after defeated the Goliath something different life something epileptic life something feigning faith something feigning life no he continued the same faith and because Elias was part of that he was moving after following the footsteps of David that means he was following the footsteps of faith and those footsteps came his footsteps so when the Philistines came that actually that was no problem to him it's unfeigned it goes where it's set to go the footsteps go forward okay I go this way ah there's an army then I go through the truth no problem because the, it's not the man that decides it's the full step it's the unfailing faith that decides the this uh, journey the direction and if there's a troop there is a troop the troop will fall down before the faith will fall down it's unfailing faith are not unfailing truth no unfailing fall even jumping over the wall it's the faith that will do it. it's not our great strength it was not the strength of this man this three man this mighty man this david it said in the verse 10 and the lord brought a great victory what true that faith mm, yes Thank you very much. Very interesting. David didn't say it is time to drink coffee over the victory of the past. If he had done that, David would have led many people to the loss of their lives. Because the faith needs to be active. The faith needs to be transferred for such a day as this. And the Holy Ghost is transferring this faith to us as we are speaking. Because Paul said, this word of faith that I speak, this thing that we are speaking, the interaction, Jesus said, the word I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And he forms the forms, the fabric of our system as we go out daily, praying, studying the word of God, what happens? We are created in that same image. We walk in that same reality. And when the army shows up, we realize that the faith suddenly does not turn back. It just moves forward. And we say, is this I? It means I can do this too. It is not us. It is what we have carried. It is what has been immersed inside of us. What has entered into our system. That is the capability of this faith utter reliance on God and men wonder where are these ones coming from they are strangers of whom the world was not worthy but they left the man what mark they know how to throw the line into the enemy's camp and rescue people from the jaws of the lion they know how to beat down wall without bulldozer. They know how to dry up the river Jordan and walk on dry foot. The same fate, transferable from Moses to Joshua, from David to Eleazar. The same fate from Paul to Timothy. The same thing. Because if we go down, what the apostle was telling Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you, that came into your life by the laying on of hands and by presbytery. But let's go back to Eleazar's story. The Bible says, and so the man arose because faith didn't tell him to call David. They didn't tell him to call for reinforcement. And so you see something in your dream and then immediately you are looking for who to call. One man of God somewhere. My friend, you should have developed more than that. You just pull your sword and begin to execute. You just turn to the Holy Ghost inside of you and say, hey, the enemy I'll tell you a story. Quite funny. Many years ago, if I remember correctly, it should be 2007, 2008, 2008. We were in a prayer meeting. And so we had a long prayer, I think over for a stretch of three or four hours or so. And so I went somewhere to lie down to sleep. Within a space, then I was still in the environment where we had the prayer meeting, just in that same compound. So I just drowsed, drowsed a little bit. I was drowsy, so I just slept a little bit. Within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, that environment we have has a fence, has a gate, so there's a little bit of security. I just slept a little bit. The next thing what I found, I see a demon entered into that place where I was sleeping. I was trying to tie my neck. So I was looking for, ah, can I breathe? So I just struggled to wake up. I said, ah, as if somebody was pushing my neck. Right. When I woke up, I said, you know what I said? I said, what? I 
access it. Huh? You have the right to cross the fence and enter into this place where I'm just lying down after praying. I said, you are in trouble. I said, you will not try this again. I got on my knees. Oh, I began to fire, pull my trigger. From that day to today, I have not seen the devil. They took off. The unfeigned faith. I didn't say, oh, let me go and call the prayer leader. Let me, hey, I'm in trouble now. No. The meaning of that. You go inside. When the Philistine rises to check if you are still there, the enemy will always come. Bible says Satan came to Jesus and, and tried to tempt him. He said, fall down. Satan came through Peter. Jesus will say, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan came through the storm, wanted to capsize the, the boat into the waters, and the disciples were screaming. It happened nothing less than two times. They were screaming for sorrow. The first time Jesus was sleeping in the boat. The second time Jesus was walking on the boat, on, on the sea. He, at least twice, they were in that challenge. Do you know none of them who activate what Jesus was trying to transfer to them? And every time Jesus always rebuked them, you are of little faith. How long will I be with you? You should have contacted this thing because this thing is transferable. Only once did Peter attempt to contact it. He said, if it is you, call me to come upon the water. And Jesus said, come. And the man began to walk on the water. But the problem that still bedeviled him continued to bedevil him even while he was walking upon the water. What is the problem? What he tries to look at. He tries to set his eyes on the storm. Instead of looking inward, looking at Jesus. Instead of looking at the power that called him to come. Instead of putting utter dependence upon the power and the wisdom in that statement that say, come upon the water. He was looking at his temptation. He was looking at the wind. He was looking at how powerful the storm was rising and the water was rising. He was looking. And when his focus turned to that, what was the next experience? He began to sing. This is why many Christians are taking mental health drugs. That is why. If everything began in a day, there is a beginning of that predicament. And what they did made them to organize a pathway for their lives. Those who see something in life and turn to God, they don't end up in a mental health institution. God forbid. Because that will be a rebuke against the faith that is in them. The Bible talks about this capability in Hebrews chapter 11. It said women receive their dead back to life. Even though they were son asunder, yet they refused to deny. That is what this faith fabricates, you know. And so, it can happen to anybody. The devil will come and come and threaten you. All you need to do is not to carry a phone call and be looking for someone to, to call. No! If that opportunity is available, well, you can use it just to join your faith. Not that you'll be so epileptic and everybody has to come and say, oh, please rise up. No! The spirit of God that resides within you, that same power that raised him from the dead, will get you off your feet. And the next Next thing, what, what is going to happen to you is that you are going to negotiate with the enemy and say, friend, you have gone too far, but no further. And that was how I had to tell Satan, you dare not jump the fence anymore to come into a place where I want to sleep for 10 minutes. And I think he listened. I think he heard. It was the faith that is within. And I could imagine, I could remember how it was that day. That day I said, what? The Satan, how dare you try this? You are in serious trouble. Oh, Satan is in trouble. Satan is afraid of those who have this unfeigned faith. And do you know, you never know that Satan will come and try you with what he doesn't want you to do. Little did I know that in few years to come, God will be casting out devil by that same person. If I had given to fear, it would have been impossible to deliver order by the power of God. Do you understand? That is what it is. Satan brings to you to tempt you with what God has ordained you to do. And if you fail, you become a slave to your fear and you cannot deliver orders. But what the apostle said when I call to remembrance, he said, I have no doubt that this capability, this faith resides permanently in your grandmother. It has been transferred to your mother and now it is in you. I have no doubt because that faith has the power and the ability to lean upon the wholeness of God, upon the wisdom of God. You don't apply the wisdom of men. Something inside of you communicates with you. Your mental system is wired not by the things that you hear outside, but by, by, by a different information system that writes you that that is resident within you. You have a particular string technology that no man can see what is residing within you. It speaks to you. It informs the, your, your language, your thinking pattern, your understanding. You don't browse wisdom from outside. You browse wisdom from within because that faith relies upon the wisdom of God. And where is wisdom? Well, without God, your honey, you can spill. 
Yes, it came to my mind a moment ago that the Why Holy Spirit is taking us this journey because as we are going now through preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles, that when Jesus chose the disciples to follow him, Peter was wavering here and there, and not just Peter, when Peter rebuked Jesus for saying that he will he will be uh, crucified, he will raise again, he will be raised again. And when Jesus turned about, he didn't just look Peter, but he looked all the disciples. So they all were with him. So the disciples were wavering here and there. They couldn't have pre bring the mystery of godliness just like they did and Acts 2 if they will be wavering here and there. If they would go over the water and just when they are over to walking on the water, they would right away look again to see and see. Because then when they were persecuted, they would have said in front of the Jews that, uh, uh, sorry for disturbing, we, yes, we will not preach anymore in the name of this Jesus. So they needed that unfeigned faith so they can preach the gospel, bring the mystery of godliness. Because same for Elias, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. He didn't think that, well, this is my cause. I will be standing here now because behind that group there, there is this coffee masses or this Coca-Cola I want to kill to enjoy myself, to have relax again. No, he stood his position because he knew that many will be saved because he will stand his position. Peter, John, apostles, all of them, Paul, they didn't make that, well, I'm now in faith. Well, I will just continue that so I will myself make it to heaven. No, they took the position of the unfeigned faith that many will be saved because Jesus didn't come here to have his good life here and show that I have this much faith and I will die and go back and look at my faith. You know? He came to save his people from their sin. He came to bring many sons to glory. The fain, what fain is aiming at is the salvation of souls, many souls. So this is all connected with that because that is the parameter, the requirement that is needed that many souls will be said that we can stand unfeigned preaching the gospel. Because if our, just like said before, if our faith is waning, going from wavering, going from here and there, we cannot transfer it. Because what we have, we transfer. If we have transfer faith that is wavering, which we, we will go ourselves fall away, the next generation will. What does that profit? Nothing. But just like what Jesus made of the apostles, of the disciples, the Peter just before when Jesus was God, when a damsel came and asked, that you are one of them, he denied and cursed, and then they asked and he denied, and then they asked and he denied. Just sometime after, continuing with Jesus, Holy Spirit coming along, then the same Peter, which stood 3,000 men with other apostles, speaking from starting, from scriptures, starting from Joel, speaking of the uh, Psalms, saying that they crucified him. The same, this was, un, this was the unfeigned way, way manifesting through him. Not just this one time, it didn't waver. It continued. They were then called when they were in the Acts chapter 3, when they healed the man at the lame man in the beautiful gate. They also confronted Sanderim, the Jews, straight away with that unfeigned way. How can a man, unlearned man, fisherman, come before the people who are every day of their lives learned of the scriptures and tell them that they are wrong? And by the way, show it by power. That is the faith that gods want to manifest through us. This is not just some history stories and night children's stories that they, that they tell there's amazing things that I know any relation to reality. This is what God wants us to do. He's showing us, do you see your nation? Do you see your city? Do you see those all those sick people, the oppressor? Do you see the church lying down and oppressed by the devil? The devil is kicking the half dead or dead church there and laughing over it. Do you see that situation? I want you to go there and kick the devil out. Show the devil his place because he's defeated. He wants to impart and show us that this is our position where he has taken us. What Peter did, what the apostles did, they were then beaten at Acts chapter 5 and they were rejoicing because they had got some suffering because of Christ. And many signs and wonders were made done by the hands of apostles. And then, and then later, Ananias and Sapphira and fear came upon all of them, all people there. And many, many more signs. And they bring lame and sick and everyone on the streets and they were. That is the reality God wants to bring us to. But what we need to have is unfeigned way. Do you think that when Peter went on the streets and he shadow, the <laughs> overshadow of the Almighty going with him, healing the sick. Do you think that Peter was going that uh, maybe I, if I pass this one, maybe this will be healed. That that looks bad as scissors. Maybe I don't pass that over that person because maybe he doesn't heal and then they will think that what is this Peter? Now he doesn't have faith. Or maybe he, he wasn't going that here and there. He know that I will what, okay, the street. Where is the street that is most sick people? Uh-huh. This street here. Right side, 200. Left side, maybe 300. Okay, that's, that's less people. I will take the later. This street. Okay, let's go. 300 
358 people completely healed by the way by the power of the holy spirit it's not trust in your power it's nothing in you you know that you are such a vessel that a, a one stone can drop from a roof and you are dead man you are in the glory with the jesus already but it's the power on the trust on jesus when you know that well the creator of the heaven and earth who created me who raised jesus christ our lord from the dead he can in the snap of fingers heal all the sick on the earth here yeah. now he wants to work through me so walking me in the midst of these trees in the midst of the many hundreds sick people is there anything too hard my god for my god no so this is easy peasy i will just walk and enjoy my time with the holy spirit he's healing people jesus is delivering people that is unfair when complete trust on god even they were in the prison before they weren't crying that oh god how did you let us go here we are so miserable and poor and almighty god but you seem not to have any power no we see the same thing that barnabas and paul were doing a part yes a silas were doing and actually 16. They were praising in God. Do you think that those apostles were doing anything else there? No, they got freed. Angel came to free them this time. And they were what they went to do? Preach these words of the new life. These men were bold. They were standing with all they had in that faith. Why? That was all they got. They were, that was their whole life. They that's all, those didn't have any back door that, uh, okay, I will try this thing. Let's see if 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 the first person I pray for doesn't he, he, he be healed instantly, whatever he has, I I I will wait that the Holy Ghost will himself will send five letters from heaven to say pray for the next person. No, he knows that when I pray for the people for this man, my Lord said that he's working with me. I lay my hands on the six and they will recover. No matter what the person experienced, this man is recovered, by the way. I die the devil and all his cousins. This man is delivered, that this man is healed at this very moment. Even though I don't see anything, I I know it has been because I trust in my God. It doesn't waver. It doesn't say that, ah, oh, well, this blind man, I just pray for completely blind, doesn't see a, a inch before him, not a centimeter before. I prayed for him. I knew he's healed. Now in this meeting, he's coming in the very midst, close distance and trying to open his eye to look something. And devil is saying to my ear, that person, that person has never been so blind before. Even though he was completely blind, he must be more blind now when you prayed after him because he seems to come close closer to you now when you prayed after him and the people they are looking all, all even the church people are looking at the man and thinking that this man has lost his anointing this must be so they, this cannot be and you are saying that you are saying, saying to everyone and enjoying with the holy spirit that i'm wait and see people wait and see my god has done it thank you holy spirit so amazing just in a second that person will open his eyes he will look around and he will scream for the joy god has given to him and every one will glorify the name of jesus it doesn't say that maybe this time it didn't work it says every time my faith works every time my god works my god has not failed me any times do we hear or read from the scripture that god failed any person any time during these thousands years no he's not gonna fail at ne us never it's our faith is not based that we feel good it based on him it cannot fail because god cannot fail mm, yes Thank you. Verse 10 says, and he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. So he began according to the spirit of faith in him. Remember the Bible says, having therefore the same spirit of faith. Is it, is it another one? He said, no, he said, we believe and therefore we speak. We also therefore believe and have spoken. Now, it is the same spirit that was resident in David that is now operating in this man. One man riot squad fighting against battalions of the Philistines and he began to smite them with the sword. Were they lining up to come to him to be killed? No, they were all aggressively trying to kill him and yet they could not kill him. The angels of the Lord would have been working with him. The angels of the Lord would have been carrying sheep that he cannot see. That every arrow shot at him is defended and deflected. And he continued to slay. And some of the soldiers will be surprised. Who are we fighting? Are we fighting Israel? One man army? What is this one? And you see the commander is dying. Another one has fallen down. And that one has fallen down. How can 10 men be dead? And one man that we are still fighting 10 minutes ago is still alive. I don't get it. Unfailed faith. They were fighting an unfailed faith. They were contending with the spirit in a man. They were contending with an everlasting God, hiding behind the flesh. 
they were contending with the maker of the heavens and the earth. They were contending with life himself. They wanted to heal life. God said no. And one man began to fight these enemies. And here is where we are going. He fought to the point that his hand were physically weary. What should be the next solution? He should drop the sword and rest. But do you know the unfeigned faith is a permanent faith? He doesn't go on vacation. It's not a tourist faith. It's not a faith on a visit. It's not a faith with a temporary address. It is a permanent faith. So when the hand physically became weary, what happened? The Bible says, and his hand clay to the sword. Now, this is not a miracle. The hand is weary from fighting. But the sword find it difficult to leave the hand, the man's hand. That means the baton. That's this is where we are going. What Brother Olimite was saying. The baton in the hands of a man with an unfavoring faith, with an unwavering faith, does not draw. The baton cleaves to our hand. The baton in the hands of a man with an unfeigned faith does not drop. The man goes to the finishing line with the baton still in his hands. He doesn't need to keep the baton alive. The baton keeps the man alive. The sword, as long as the sword is in the man's hand, that man cannot die because the man continued to kill the enemy until the enemy had to speak to themselves and say, we are dying. Should we continue dying or should we leave this man alone? <laughs> Imagine that the hands of the man cleave to the sword, the weary hands. Now, this is not now physical, this is spiritual. I tell you, your hand will cleave to the sword, your hand will cleave to the baton. The unwavering faith is the, he has the capability to ensure that your hand cleave to the sword. What great victory! Look at the outcome. And the Lord wrought great victory. So it was the Lord that was hiding behind this tiny fellow. It was the Holy Ghost that was executing the Philistine using one man. You see, when God's hand is the one fighting the battle, your hand may be weary, your knees may be weary, your mouth may be weary because of too much prayer. But my friend, do you know what is happening? You are that weariness of your flesh is giving capability to God to utilize that flesh for a great victory. So that when the victory comes, you will not say it's because of the skill of my hand. No, that hand was already weary. If you have dropped that hand, you would have died in that second. But God takes over the hands and cleave the sword into the hands and God now begin to execute and the man is watching the drama. The man is looking at his weary hand moving like this. Cutting the enemy. Cutting the enemy. Cutting the enemy. The man is watching the drama and he's laughing and he's saying, ha, what is going on? They are dying. What is going on? And he's killing them and the enemies are crying and saying, yeah, 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 yeah. And are, you don't understand? When the Holy Ghost activate unfeigned faith inside of us, Christianity and the supernatural becomes very simple. We are not the one acting. We don't labor. He does the job. You cast out devil. We don't labor. He does the job. He doesn't, it, it is, it is, it is, it is not difficult. Like I was telling us a few hours ago, that when the Holy Ghost cast out devil from someone, Andama said, ah, why can't I do the same? I have tried this thing over the night. You just came. And in one minute, you, everything just went away. When God takes over the hand of a man, the mouth of a man with an unwavering faith, the heart and the heart and the mouth of a woman with an un unwavering faith, everything becomes a piece of bread. We are only advertising the defeat of the enemy that Jesus has procured by the cross. To advertise the defeat is very simple. The victory is what is more difficult and Jesus had obtained that. So now, advertise that Satan has been defeated. Why is it difficult for us? So when we cast out devil, what are we doing? We are advertising that Satan has been defeated. That's all. We are not the one casting out the devil. We don't have the power to do so. The unfeigned faith heals the sick, raises the dead. So it's an advertisement. When the shadow of Peter by the Holy Ghost begin to cast out devils, begin to heal the sick, what, what is God doing? Peter is simply advertising that the Jesus you crucified, this is what he got for you. So when the people bring handkerchief to put it on Paul's body or Peter's body and go and put on a sick person, the person is healed. What is that? An advertisement of the capability, of the power, of the wisdom, of the goodness of God. They said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Who went about doing what? Doing good. The goodness of God. The advertisement of the goodness of God is that... 
he does go, anywhere he goes. But that advertisement is connected to an unfeigned face. And the Bible says, this man had a great victory as a result of heaven working with him. Everybody in Israel only came to gather this spoil. Nobody in Israel fought on that day. Only one man. I wish that kind of day can multiply. Imagine if Israel has 10,000 men and these 10,000 men are like Eliezer of Dodo. There are, they don't have 10,000 countries that are fighting against them. One man is enough. How many years will it take God? To take over Europe if he has just one of Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Hawaii. How long will he take God? But a man's hand will cleave to the sword, and the Lord will wrought great victory. Has the Holy Ghost called you? Has the Spirit of God be telling you things? Ensure that your faith is the unfeigned one and focus on it because God is able to wrought a great victory. But Alumide, do you want to share something? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, as we were just discussing uh, the about the faith, it reminds me of what Paul the Apostle also said to Timothy. I uh, also said to Titus, rather, because he was their tutor, he taught them in the way of the Lord, and uh, he passed across to them the same faith we are talking about. And he was so sure. And no wonder sometimes he will call them fellow laborers. Sometimes he will refer to them as people who are like-minded, because when the faith is rightly communicated, the product of the faith is not different. It produces the same faith. So in Titus 1, verses 4 and 5, it was talking about the common common faith. And I remember we said, it's common, but it's not ordinary. That was what he said in our last Bible study. Do is common, but it's not ordinary. Then in verse 5, he now says something. In that Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he said, for this cause, you know, the, the faith the right faith that Jesus died for, the one we call the unfeigned faith today, it always produces a cause. When David was standing and everybody was challenging him, he told them, he said, is there not a cause? <laughs> because he knew what was right, what was resident in him. And with that faith, not just the catapult like uh, Bro Andrew said, not just the catapult, he brought down Goliath by that faith, the faith he carried. So uh, Paul the Apostle was telling Titus, he said, I am leaving you here for a purpose. There is something I've communicated to you, and I don't want that thing to die with you. It could have taken, it could have taken him along also. So he was making provision for something, you know, there, there, there is always an after aftermath. He wants what he has done in them to have an aftermath effect in, 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 in increase. So when we look at the faith we are talking about, the reason why devil is not bothered in, in religious gathering, in Christian gathering, so to say today, is because what is being communicated is not the right one. And it doesn't bother the devil where the wrong one is communicated. What bothers the kingdom of darkness is when the right faith is being communicated because he is aware he's in trouble. When all of a sudden somebody gave the right faith, passed the right faith across to 10 people and it's multiplying like that, the whole world will be turned upside down for the Lord Jesus. So he told uh, Titus, he said, he said for this course, you need to be focused. We have a goal. We have something to achieve. It's just like where we are now. You know, if God tarries, we are not just going to remain here forever. We are still going to leave. Then who and who will receive the battle? Who, what provision are we making for the life after when we leave this place? So he said for this course, left ID in Crete that thou, you know, should they set in order the things which are wanting. The faith sets things in order. Just like Brandro was saying, you know, we don't have to be a shallow believer that will be soliciting for maybe prayer here and there. When we know something that is there, it has a way of setting things in order. If there is an area of the ministry, if there is an area of the marriage that has something that, you know, that is disorder, it has a way of reordering it. Maybe you are privileged to be in a Christian gathering. Your, the main fact that you are there, the right faith you are carrying can set some things in order. Don't be surprised. I've I've heard of cases where the founder of a ministry answer, you know, uh, 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 when an altar call is made, such people came out to give their life to Christ. You can imagine such a thing. Things has to be reordered. So in, in Christian gatherings, in places of worship, you know, maybe we are privileged to be there. Things can be reordered by virtue of what we carry. And that was what he was telling uh, uh, Titus. Uh, he was telling Titus that, and he said, an ordained elder in every uh, in every city ordained. So what what makes an ordination? It's not just the ceremony. It's not just the the regalia. You know, so people they, they you know they are interested. They want to stand. They have a good posture. 
that the photographer can capture them. They will have a memory of what happened many years ago. You know, it goes beyond that. What makes an ordination is what is passed across. What is transferred to that person is what makes an ordination. And he told him, he said, it has to produce the same effects as I appointed you. You know what happened when you know what transpired when you were ordained? The same thing should happen when I'm not there. Amen. Absolutely. That's, that is great that all the apostles can leave an entire civilization into the hands of Titus. He said, for this cause. Paul the apostle was so sure of the capability of an unfeigned faith in Titus. By the same token, he was so sure of what resides in Timothy. And he tells Timothy, let no man despise that thy youth. So Timothy was a small boy, but Paul the apostle was making this guy an apostle. Because sometimes when the Bible writes, it says, Paul, Timothy, and us, apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy, a youth. What is the definition of a youth? Somebody less than 24 years old. That's a youth. And does not look like that? Any under 24 years? Yeah. And Paul the apostle is living. Titus and Timothy into the into the hands of the enemy so to speak into the arena full of wolves and foxes ready to devour them and paul said for this cause i leave you alone here and when i leave you alone here these are the things you need to do set things in order the question is how what do has given us the answer the faith has the capability to set things in order the bible says god is a god of order he does decently and things and put things in order right he's not the author of confusion let everything be done decently and in order how can it be done decently and in order the capability to order things said is resident in the holy ghost the one that engineers the faith. It is a spirit. It is an impartation. And yet Paul the Apostle went ahead and he kept on telling Titus. He said, not only that, find the things that are wanting. The faith that we carry, the faith in Paul, the faith in Titus, the faith in Timothy is a faith that has a diagnostic ability and diagnostic capability to identify what is lacking. Remember, we were discussing it a few days ago, Johanny, when Paul the Apostle said, I would like to come to you again to set in order the things that are lacking in your faith. How does he recognize what is lacking in somebody's faith? Is he an arrogant man? So it doesn't mean his own is complete. So he's always going finding fault in every church he goes to. You know, have you heard that before? It's the same Holy Ghost. Oh, you went to this, this, these people are not doing things well. It is not you. It is a spirit that understands that there is something wanting in this place. You don't have a judgmental spirit, friend. Oh, the apostle wrote it. He said, I will come to you and try to update what is lacking amongst you. It is my desire to see you. He said, for this I travel night and day and pray so that I might come to you and perfect what is lacking. If you don't know what is lacking, how dare do you know what needs to be perfected? The faith we are talking about is a faith that many people get to heaven and they've not even used 0.5% of its capability. These are men that were trying to expand and extend the capability of this faith to reach every frontier because they know that this faith in Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Haohai, was able to defeat an entire civilization. Do you know the Philistines will get back home, the ones that, that went home with half one, one year one hand, one leg, they will go and tell their generation that where there is an Eliezer in Israel, you can fight everybody, but not this one. Only one army riot squad and defeat an entire country. There is something in that creature that 10,000 men cannot hear. Do you know? If this is the kind of faith we transfer to disciples, if this is the kind of faith we transfer to believers in Christ, we can be so sure that either we are there or not, they cannot fall. We can be so sure. All the apostles understand how great it's, a, it's, it's, it's an island. That place is still alive. We see Crete is still, is still existing on today's map. And it's an island with civilization, with trade, because sheep crosses that place. It's a place busy with rich men, merchants at that time. And he said, Titus, the money and the intelligence and the influence of the people cannot shut down what is inside of you. You go there. For this cause, I leave you here. Because the common faith in me is also in you. And I'm not trusting in your physical ability. I am trusting in the ability bestowed upon you by what you carry. And he said, the things that are wanting, 
the things that are wanting. You know, something can be missing and you are not aware because you didn't look for it. For example, let's assume that one of your shoes is missing from the shoe rack. As long as you don't want to go out, you're only wearing your house sander. You are not aware that something is missing until you want to step out and you say, oh, where's my shoe? It has been missing since. So it is because you are oriented to go outside. That's why you suddenly realize the lack of the shoe, right? Because you have a responsibility now. You have a target. You have a goal. You see, many Christians don't have goals. They don't have target. That is the reason why they are not aware that something is missing. But the faith that we are talking about is a faith that is targeted. It's a faith that also comes with irresponsibility. It's a faith that will always compel us to do something for the kingdom. Either we like it or not. We will be uneasy every Every single day until we have contributed meaningfully in one way or the other, either by prayer, either by counseling, either by discipleship, either by preaching, in one way or the other, the faith compels us to expand the frontiers of the kingdom and to perfect what is lacking. So the word we say, judge not. Nobody is perfect. It is a lie. Men who carry on faith, faith are perfect. What the apostle said, as many has been perfect, be thus minded. It's in the Bible. There is a mindset for those that carry this capability on faith, faith. What the apostle said, on faith, faith does not apply for temporary residence. It does not apply for temporary visa. On faith, faith, always look for those who opens the door for permanent residence. Not only that, on faith, faith opens the door to colonize or to acquire citizenship. <laughs> like Eliezer, the unfeigned faith inside of him so colonized his body that even though his hands were physically weary, the sword refused to drop from his hand. His hand claved to the sword. An angel of the Lord tied his hand to the sword and began to execute judgment over sinners. This is an hard saying. This is strong meat. It's not for kids. On faith, faith. And he went ahead. He said, an order being elders, like what Olumide was saying, it's not saying, go and sew them a new garment. Go and put a new mitre on their head and put a new gadu around their waist. Orange, color, white, yellow, whatever it is. And then ring bell and then carry the incense. Is that not what they are doing here everywhere? Ordination, ordaining priest. Nonsense. Not that type. He said, ordain elders the way I appointed you. Ordain elders by the same token by which you can also leave them in Greece. What should be the desire of a God the Apostle to reproduce himself? What should be in desire of a Titus to reproduce himself? That means if Titus has that understanding, Titus will not negotiate for a faith that is not serious, that is not original. If Paul has a desire that this thing I have touched will not end with me, he will also not negotiate for a temporary faith. And Paul the Apostle said, as I appointed you, I give you an authorization. Go to every city. If there are 50 cities in Crete, the faith is sufficient to ordain elders in 50 cities because that faith cannot be limited by geographical affronts, by satanic affronts. So who says there is a place God's children cannot enter? It is just a matter of faith and of faith, faith, unwavering faith. This is the faith we are to earnestly contend for. This is a challenge to believers. Ask yourself, all these things you are crying about and say, hey, see my problem, see my confusion. Somebody comes and just tell you one or two scriptures, you are confused. Go inside. There is something within that carries the glory that as the person is speaking, you can identify the wantingness in this person's life. You can identify where the person is lacking and the person is using both face. And you that carry the original, you are cowing like a couch potato. My friend, get up. As you have been ordained, evade the territory and ordain elders. Not ordination. Ordination by power. Ordination by might. Ordination by the Holy Ghost. Who is scaring you? Who is threatening you? Who is, who is confusing you when heaven lies within you? Permanently. Or faint face. Sako, is something coming to your mind? And then before we pray, we look at the last scripture. Sako, is anything coming to your mind you want to add? No, just earlier, I think about the verse that God's with all there is without vision. So, yeah, it's true. We must have the verse and the prophet that has the vision and that must be in every generation. Yes. Mm. The faith comes with a vision. Yes, the Holy Ghost captured that responsibility, goals, passion, orientation. The faith is not idle. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. Whosoever has the faith does not just wait in idleness. The faith keeps us on the move. Something to be done for the kingdom every single day. Every single day. Every single day. There's no excuse.
Lastly, we will read Ephesians chapter 4. You want to hear Paul's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 and verse 14. This is Paul the Apostle's charge to us. Till we all come into, into unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said, till we all come. Is there any excuse for anybody? No. So we are on a journey to lay hold of what heaven has provided for us. We are on a journey to either we accept that this is what God has made as a provision for Christians, or we choose to create our own provision for our own selves. But history has always told us that anyone that goes beyond the opportunities that God has granted to believers, in Christendom and stepping out of the boundaries of God's provision for our victory, such a person falls like a pack of cards because Satan does not understand what that is. That was why the sons of Skiva that were trying to create a new religious system by casting out devil without unfeigned faith, they ran away naked because Satan descended upon them mightily. And the devil gave them a small level of theological discourse. The devil opened to them, casting out demon 101 course and told them, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know, but who are you? You know, the devil knows those that have an unfeigned faith. The devil knows those that have a faith that cannot be quenched. The devil knows those that can decide to die because of the faith that they have found. The devil knows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that will refuse to bow down to idols. Why? Because they said, if God does not deliver us from this fire, we will still not bow down. Let's go there. And they were cast into fire. Did they come out alive? Unfeigned faith preserved them. And here, Paul the Apostle said, Ephesians 4, verse 13, till we all come into the unity of this faith. Till we all come. And he's talking to a church. Paul said, if we don't arrive there, the enemy will make a fool at all. That is why so many churches are so empty of the grace of God. Why? Because both the pastor, both the pulpit and the pew have not arrived at the level where the faith of God has been encrusted in their heart as on a permanent basis. They are just there dancing around and dancing around and shaking body and dancing around and playing music and dancing around. Faith is much more than that. In faith, you settle down. You settle down. You don't dance. You settle down. You settle down and assimilate through the word of God the importance partition that faith produces. You don't quickly rush to the cake and coffee table. There is nothing there because it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You eat bread at home. You come to church and you are almost gasping for, for, for bread because cake and coffee has not come at 15 past 10. And it looks as if we need to call the ambulance because you're already becoming fidgety, anxious because cake and coffee is not yet ready. What kind of Christianity is this one? Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God that proceeds from the mouth of God. That faith is crafted, is engraved, is fabricated, is manufactured, is structured, is immersed into our being and it forms the texture of our language, our communication, our desire, our thinking process, how we analyze events. It is the faith that gives us a new orientation and God is calling us through Paul the Apostle till we all come into the unity of this faith. Paul already had it. Paul had just told us, Timothy has it. Paul has just told us Titus has it. Paul is now writing to the church in Ephesus. We all must have this thing. And you will see the reason why we need to have it. He said this faith is the only one that guarantees us few things. Look at it. Number one. He said, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, whosoever has an unwavering faith, whosoever has intermingled with this wisdom, whosoever has become part and parcel of this faith, what happens? The person already has the ATM card for the knowledge of God. Draws from the fountain of wisdom. Every point in time when the person opens his mouth to speak, wisdom falls out and men wonder, how old are you? Where are you coming from? Who taught you this thing? It is because of unfeigned faith. They can't see that. Or oh, do you want to write it on your CV, Yohani? As part of your CV, I am a programmer. I know how to do this. Then you write there, I also have unfeigned faith. The world will say, what are you talking about? It doesn't need to be written legibly for them to see, but they will see the character. Till we all come. Till we all come. In, in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. You know, everywhere Jesus goes, people wonder, who taught this man this thing? Why does he speak with so much authority and power? 
He said, they consider the unlearned disciples. Do you know their conclusion? They said, the only thing they could conclude, these guys are fishermen, they are uneducated, they are ignorant, but there is only one thing, in as much as we cannot find the origin of their intelligence, we can only say one thing, they are being with Jesus. Oh, may the generation we live in say that about us. That we have been with Jesus. They might have been in the world. They might have been with the encyclopedia. They might have been with all the Greek philosophers. But it pairs into its significance when a man like Eliezer shows up and he begins to speak of wisdom of the ancients. People wonder, in spite of all my gray head in all the intelligence of woman ability, here comes a little man, a little boy, a little girl, dazzling me with the volume of wisdom proceeding out of his leaves. It is not us. It is because we have become his embassy. The Holy One resides within here. You will see this evidence in your place of work. See, this thing is an impartation today. It's an ordination. And the Holy Ghost is ordaining that as from this Bible study S4, the spirit of wisdom will work with you. It's an ordination. As a guarantee that the faith, as a guarantee, as you can't test if the faith is in you, wisdom will be the productivity. What the apostle said, if we can lay lean upon this entire God who has all power, who has all wisdom, who has all mind, if we can lean fully on him, this is what you will. Let's give you cardinal sign. He will work with you. He will work with you. Daniel was ten times better in Babylon. And they wonder where is he coming from? The Holy God resides in him. The unfeigned faith, that faith that told him you cannot defile yourself by eating the food sacrificed to idols. And he drew the line and he said, never. I have possessed something that is better than the scholarship of the king of Babylon. And they negotiated with him. And from that day forward, that man became a presidential candidate. Oh, the Holy Ghost will mesmerize our world. If we can focus on this God, I tell you, men, white men, gray men, blue men, yellow men, pink men, in any generation, they will sit on the floor and listen to us. I'm telling you, because we are ambassador of an eternal wisdom. We have God having our house, our life as a permanent resident address. And sometimes he may like to peep through the window of our eyes. He may like to speak through our little tongues of clay. And men hear it and say, wow, where is this wisdom coming from? Remember, when Jesus was at the canal of Galilee, after the wine finished, the best one came out. When the hand of heaven touched the water, it became wine. And the man said, why have you left the best for the, for the last? They didn't know that heaven had contaminated the wedding ceremony. <laughs> Anywhere you go, as you leave this place by the Holy Ghost, you will be a spiritual contaminant. You you will begin to contaminate things with the wisdom of God. You will begin to drive out darkness from places. You will begin to open the eyes of the blind, spiritually blind people. Men will talk to you and they will say, I want to hear you again. Give me your number. People will begin to make, in fact, you don't have time anymore. You just, you just like Jesus. Anywhere you go, men will sit down, say they wonder at the gracious words that proceeds out of his mouth. They sent people to go and arrest him. The people that wanted to arrest him, they decided to sit down and they were listening to him. When they came back empty-handed, what was their response? They said, never man speak like that one. How do we arrest such kind of person? We were entertained with the wisdom of God. And then should we carry our gun and arrest such a fellow? The, 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 the mob will kill us. We just respected ourselves and just went back empty and dead because we heard what we never heard. Do you know that that same Jesus resides in you? This is why Satan we want to tempt you to go into sin because there is a capacity he wants to steal away. He's a thief. Don't give him a chance. That's why he will tempt you with everything. Because he knows that as long as we remain upon this unwavering faith, on this unfeigned faith, we can never be defeated. We are undefeatable. He knows we are a threat to his kingdom. And so he will create so many stone walls, so many bulwarks of obstruction. He will try to end us. That was why Paul said, I would like to come to you in Thessalonica, right? I would like to come to you and help you and perfect what is wanting in your life. He said, but Satan Satan entered me. He said, I'm traveling night and day in prayer. Can you imagine? Satan knows that if this guy gets to this place, he will make everybody to be like him. I mean, I'm in trouble. They will drive me out of this city. Is that not why Satan will be fighting us? We will prevail. Till we all come. Till we all come. All of us. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. This is the kind of faith that will make you to challenge a pastor who is speaking evil. That will make you to challenge someone, a leader of a church who is inviting you to come and sin against God. 
This is the kind of faith we're talking about. Unwavering faith. Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. The faith we're talking about makes us perfect. We are washed by the word, by the washing of water by the word. He produces a perfection. It rinses us. It cleanses us from within. Our purification comes from within. Because the Bible says what defies a man is not what enters into the man's mouth, right? It is what comes out of the mouth of the man. Now, if the faith we are talking about had mean good with everything that is inside of us, what will come out of our mouth? The word of God. We are perfect people. In what we say, what we think, we are perfected. He said, till we all come unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is terrifically deep. We don't have time. That the faith we are talking about is to make us Christ here on earth before we get to earth. And imagine everything that Christ represents. Imagine it. Imagine everything that Christ lives. And God says, my project for every believer is to arrive at the same level, Jesus. So when I see you, honey, I see Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost is saying. When I see Christ, I see Sarah. When I see Christ, I see Dr. Shadi. That is how it's supposed to be. That we all become little, little Christ everywhere. Do you know we become an headache for Satan? Satan will have a terrible migraine eternally. When there are too many Christ on the streets. Christ everywhere. You tell me it is this kind of little Christ that will be flying gay flags and aberration. Do you see why our generation is confused? There is no permanent faith. There is no unfailed faith. There is no strong faith. What they are carrying about and they call religion cannot be contained there because Satan is not afraid of it. Satan is afraid of this one because this one denies ungodliness and worldly laws. This one strives against sin, fighting even to the drop of the blood. This one does not count his life so dear unto himself. He can die because of the faith like Stephen. Men are so have sworn an allegiance to this kind of faith. Those are the men that fraternize with heaven and they crack open their generation and they allow people to enter heaven from the pit of hell. It is the faith, like the faith in the heart of Eleazar, the son of Dodo, that will cause another generation to come and gather this spoil. Don't mind what the Holy Ghost is taking us through. We are preparing the next generation to gather this spoil. The enemy has had a feed day, but God is able to come to his around. And he's looking for one, one Titus, one Timothy, one Paul that will take up the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Let's just run through verse 14, Johanny. So we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We continue from here in two weeks' time. But look at the tragedy that a lie that lacks this faith is a lie that is upside down, scattered disjointed, not organized, tossed to and fro, not sure of anything, incisive, undecided. Every, oh, they said, oh, this is not the new doctrine now. That one said, oh, yes, let us go that direction. Oh, this is not the new religion now. Oh, let us go that direction. This is now the new faith now. We have to add circumcision to our salvation. Let us go that direction. Always tossed to and fro. Verse 14 tells us, he said that we as fought be no more children. Tossed to and fro. That means when we don't come into the unity of this faith, we are children in the spirit. But those who come into this unity of this faith, they are men in the spirit. It doesn't matter their physical size in the physical realm. And the Bible tells us that you no more be henceforth children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So the Methodist says this, and that one says this, the Catholic says this, the Lutheran says this, this one says this. Imagine, some people were telling us, Oh, we can't preach in their church. Why? Because we talk about infant baptism. My friend, it is okay. But we say it again by the Spirit of God. Infant baptism is not in the Bible. You don't baptize an infant by sprinkling of water, either by immersion or whatever. It's an infant. He has never sinned. You only baptize somebody who has repented of sin. And that has to be someone who has acquired the age of accountability to repent of sin, to acknowledge he's a sinner, and to turn around. That's the only person that can be baptized in water. And so the belief system that if you do infant baptism, as soon as you baptize, Test your child in water and you sprinkle his uh, water on the head and take it to the priest and the child is, is now protected from devils. It's a lie. There's nothing like that in the Bible. Do you know millions of people believe that garbage and they build an entire spiritual so-called Christian institution on that trash? They build a house upon the sand. It will fall. But God is saying we should erect something upon the rock of ages. 
that will stand forever. Tarried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. We can't be deceived. When the Holy Ghost is in us, when this faith is in us, when this unshakable wisdom resides within us, we can't be deceived. Our time is up. Let's spend the next 10 minutes praying. Let's begin to call upon God. Let's begin to ask the Holy Ghost to reconfigure all the faith that we have, to make it the genuine. Every form of deviation, we must come into the unity of this faith. This is what guarantees the perfect stature of the fullness of Christ. This is what guarantees the heavenly wisdom that we proceed out of our mouth. And that when we open the scriptures or when we deal with things in the physical realm, this is how men we know that we have been with him. When we have come into the unity of this unfeigned faith, gain faith in the mystery of godliness, the faith to strive for, the faith to wrestle for. Like Eleazar, the son of Dodo, was not looking like 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 David. I was not saying, "Oh, I wish I can be like this man." And then he runs away. He stayed there. He stayed there. He stayed there until the David faith became Eleazar's faith. He walked in the same footprint until he could address thousands of soldiers all alone by himself. He made a provision of spoil by the greatness of the power of God inside of him. Why has the Holy Ghost brought you here tonight? It is not by accident. God is telling you, you have been cowing for too much, for too long. You are not a couch potato. You are not a backbone Christian. The heavenlies reside within you. Great is he that lives with within you. All you need is to activate that unfeigned faith and allow the faith to reside in you on a permanent basis, not on a temporal basis. You don't have faith in the afternoon and then have doubt in the night. You don't have doubt in the afternoon, in the morning and then have faith in the afternoon. You don't begin to shift like shifting shadows. You must be emphasized and continually established on the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Brethren, pray and tell the Holy Ghost to configure this thing in our spirit, man, that we will have what Titus had. We must have what Paul had. We must have what Timothy had. We must have the experience they had. It is the faith that allows the wisdom of God to come to this generation. And men we say, what a wise brother, what a wise sister, what a wise brethren. Men and women of God. We must come to the stature of the fullness of Christ. We must come to the knowledge of this Christ. We must be immersed and inserted in our system. We can never be the same again. God must find a way to build us up in the most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. We must do something for the kingdom every day. We must contribute to the discipleship of God's children. We must contribute the same power, the same glory. Yeah, there was a time when Titus began. And there was a time when Titus became such a man that could ordain elders in every city. He became an ordinator of men. He became an apostle to Crete. But Titus became such a giant that Paul the Apostle said, For this cause, I can leave you behind. I can leave you behind. I can leave you behind because I know. You have what I've got. What have we got in? What has the Holy Ghost crafted in us? What has the Holy Ghost fabricated in us? This is a hard saying tonight. Are we willing? Are we willing? Are we ready to get what heaven has for us? We must be ready to open our arms wide and say, God, it is our time. It is our turn. It is our generation. We must not allow ourselves to be ridiculed by the enemy. No, 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 no. Let us ask the Holy Ghost to help us until we come to the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is what we want. And the next thing we we'll begin to see the demonstration of his power. You will begin to see the devil are cast out. The eyes of the blind are open. People who are about to die, they come back to life. We we'll begin to see. We lay our hands upon the sick and they recover. That is not what we are pursuing. Those are the 
aftermath effect of a strong faith. Those are the aftermath effect of a permanent faith. Those are the aftermath effect of the unwavering faith. Do we all come into the unity of this faith? Onto the knowledge of Christ. Onto the stature of the fullness of Christ. God has an agenda for us. There is a goal. Something lacking in our spirit is being perfected this night. Pray and call upon God. The Holy Ghost has opened our eyes to see things. And anything God has spoken to you and as God has identified that is lacking in your spirit, begin to ask God, this. this part is lacking in me. I have a lot of doubt in my heart. Begin to pray like that and say, oh God, have mercy. All my doubt in your faith. Help me to rest upon you like the grandmother of Timothy, who all actedly launched herself and gambled entirely on the help of the Almighty. And her life never remained the same. She touched what was golden, what was transmissible, what was worked out wonders in the heart of Timothy. What now began to dwell in Timothy's life? It is time. It is time. It is time. If the parents get the original, the children will catch up with it. If a disciple has the original, the disciple will catch up with it. If a David gets the original, and Eliezer will be contracted with the same thing. If a Paul, the apostle, gets the original, a Timothy and a Titus will receive the same invitation. Tonight, the Holy Ghost will give us this original. He is the producer. He has proof. He has done it for others. He will do it for us. Begin to call upon God. Whatsoever is lacking in our faith, whatsoever is wanting within us, whatsoever we see and we have observed, that does not allow us to represent heaven appropriately. Whatsoever that diminishes our stature, the stature of Christ in us, it is time to correct those things. It is time to repair those things. It is time to amend those things. For God Almighty has a plan, has a project. When the kingdom for such a time another civilization is to be is to be overwhelmed by men and women who are christ who are christ-like who look like christ who talk like christ who thinks like christ who are wise as christ men and women who operate by the spirit of god have been there for the same spirit of faith i believe therefore i speak we also believe and are spoken that same spirit of faith can come to you come in the unity of faith till we all come in the unity of faith, faith of our fathers living still. Maru kapu saka muto marabata dias. Tatu marake teke vilia sadabrea. Teku rima teke rupa la karuka kakata di kriya kataya. Ninto kasiva la karuka teva. Zuheri matende ne mente ki numalasia. Ipo ka kapu kafalias. Let's keep on praying. Let's keep on praying. Let's keep on praying. This faith we must have. This faith we must receive. This faith we must see. Labando kata karuka pataya. Nentuke develi se kriya kaputi animale. Rukon kakata masuki vachine masalia. In Jesus' name we have prayed. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Faith of our fathers living still. In spite of dungeon on fire and sword oh how I art beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word fate of our father's holy fate we will be true to thee till death that's true. Our fathers chained in prison, still in heart and conscience free, and blessed would be their children's fate if they like them should die for the fate of our father. That's only fate. We will be true to thee till death. Stands us three. Fate of our fathers, we will strive to win all nations unto thee and through the truth. 
good that comes from God. Mankind shall then indeed be free. Faith of a father, the holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Stanzas four. Faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe in all our strife and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life. Faith of our fathers, only faith we will be true to thee till death. Let's sing stanza one alone, alone before we can conclude. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers only faith we will be true to thee till death. Maybe we sing stanza three again. Faith of our fathers we we strive to win all nations unto thee and through the truth that comes from God mankind shall then indeed be free faith of our father's holy faith we will be true to the till death. Amen. May the Holy Ghost help us to strive for this faith that was once delivered unto the saint. Thank you, Lord. For this message I ask that we will strengthen our faith that we can go as far as you want us to go and we will don't need to turn back in any, any time but our faith will be testimony to people around us and they will come to salvation in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, anymore. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so, Lord, we thank you for this timely word. Thank you for this message, Father, that came just at the right time. We exalt the holy name, Father, for speaking to us again as a children, reminding us of the great mandate and what we placed here on earth. Father, help us to run with this race. Help us to run this race of according to your will in the name of Jesus. Amen. Help us to build a bold about Christ everywhere we go in the name of Jesus. Father, then this is the trust word and this sinful word. Don't be bold about Christ. Father. Give us this boldness and Jew us with boldness and Jew us with your faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. But I will ask that you have your will in our life. Lord Jesus, speak to us. Speak to others through us. That be able to populate the kingdom of heaven and the populate the kingdom of hell through your word in the name of Jesus. Help us to live with this remembrance that you are coming back someday and help us to live a holy life in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Eternal Rock of Fiji, we appreciate you. Thank you for the teaching of today. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you for the treasure you have committed in our hands. We are praying and asking Lord Jesus that you will give us the grace to have the full concept of this trade and rightly communicate it to people around us and rightly communicate it to our generation. Just like it happened to the grandmother of Timothy that even taught fourth generation after us, as long as the earth remains, we pray, O oh God, that you will give us grace so that the true treasure that you have given to us in our generation will be rightly communicated and we continue till we see you face to face. Thank you for everyone you have used tonight. Replenish each other 
and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord Jesus, to hear your word. Another opportunity, Lord Jesus, to fellowship with the brethren. Father, we thank you because you are increasing us with faith. Father, we thank you because as we are hearing your word, we are increasing in learning. Father, we thank you because we know that we will not go back to sin, Lord, the way you have wished to us today. Holy Spirit, we thank you because we know that you are imputing in us your word. That your word says, Lord Jesus, that we will hear your word and we will grow and increase in learning. Father, Lord, may we not go back the same, Lord Jesus. As you have given us faith, Father, may our faith, O Lord, grow daily in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray, Lord, that we may not be hearers of your word, but doers of your word also. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. May we not be like those beholding their face in the mirror and once they leave, they forget who they are. May we constantly know who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we ask that you strengthen us, O Lord, for the days ahead. That as we go out into the field, Lord Jesus, that you will use us as instruments, Father, in faith, Lord, to bring people on to your kingdom to preach the gospel unwavering in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you because you are increasing us in learning. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for thank your word. We magnify your holy name because you alone are worthy to be praised, Jesus. Father, we thank you for today. What is not by our might, is not by our power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. For it is by your mercies, Lord Jesus, that we are not consumed. Father, just as we have learned today about the people of faith, passed down from generation, from the grandmother, oh Lord, unto his mother, unto Timothy. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, that as we have heard your word today, may we pass down this faith unto our children, unto our children's children. May it not die with us in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus. Father, as we strive for the faith, help us to project it onto the next generation. Help us to be teachers of your word, that our children will grow to know you and serve you and do greater works. Like you said in your word, that greater work than this shall we do when you left us on the earth. Father, as we are walking in that light of greatness, we ask that greater works our own children do in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will continue to strengthen us from grace unto grace and from glory unto glory, that we will continue to hear your word, we will continue to study your word. We will not be discouraged, Lord, by what is happening around us. We will continue to walk in faith and not by sight. Father, help us to teach the gospel, the unwavering truth, the undiluted truth. Like was spoken earlier, the doctrines are being infiltrated with various things that people are now making and saying to suit them. Heavenly Father, help us to be bold, to preach the undiluted word of God, to preach the word of God that is directly from the scripture. Father, Lord, that you have influenced us with, with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you take charge of every opportunity we have to preach, to grow, to learn. May we not yield to the desires of the flesh. May we be led by the Spirit at all times. Help us to acknowledge when we are walking in our flesh and to turn back to you, O Lord, and walk in the Spirit. Father, Lord, we rebuke every spirit of pride in us. We ask for humility, Lord Jesus, to walk in humility in your way, to walk in humility during the work of Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, help us to strengthen the brethren, O Lord. Help us to strengthen one another in faith. Help us to grow mightily in your word. Help us, Lord, not to backslide in any area of our lives, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to bring us into that consciousness, into that awareness of where we are lacking. Holy Spirit, that is the work that you do in us. You search our hearts. You search us through and through. And you tell us the areas in which we are lacking. Father, may we not be blinded to those areas. May we not be, Lord Jesus, be, be taken away from those areas and feel that we are competent in ourselves. For without you, we are nothing. Help us to acknowledge our limitations and help us to hang on to the strength in which you have given us the holy spirit to guide and direct and uplift us help us to continually put our trust in you let us not depart from your presence oh lord may we forever be in your presence lord for in your presence there's fullness of joy yes. and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore but i will thank you because we'll see many more gatherings like this in faith that will continue to grow and strengthen the brethren thank you lord because you have heard us we are exalted and glorified oh lord for in jesus name we pray amen, amen. thank you Yes, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, dear Holy Spirit, that you have spoken to us and guided us this evening. And as you have spoken to us, as you have given your grace and invitation over us, we shall experience the same things you have spoken. You shall bring us to battle where it seemed as all Israelites have left. But we have unfeigned faith that, faith that we trust in you. The sword will be cleaved <laughs> into our hands and we will be looking at what is happening when you are moving and slicing the enemy for us. And we are enjoying our time with you, Lord. Thank you that you will just like true Titus you will ordain you will put in order the things that need to be put in order put the words in our mouth speak through our mouths the wisdom of God to this dying generation that they will see your glory and will more marvel and wonder and come to the knowledge of the only true God and his son Jesus Christ we give you all the praise for this evening thank you Father in the name of Jesus we have right now Amen Amen, Amen.